Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we have the good fortune to be joined by David Trainer of New Constructs. David put out a note last week with his team on Tesla that was relatively bearish, so I thought it would be a good opportunity to have somebody on the podcast to maybe give a different perspective than what I sort of give day to day, and hopefully we can both learn a little bit throughout the course of the conversation. Uh, so David is a former analyst with Credit Suisse, and then for the last uh, couple decades, he is the founder and CEO of New Constructs, an investment research firm. So David, anything you want to add to that in terms of uh, your guys' work and uh, specifically this note on Tesla? Yeah, sure. No, we, we're an independent research firm, so we don't, we're not doing any investment banking or trading. Uh, there was a time when I ran a hedge fund, but we don't do that anymore. So there's there's no short position in Tesla. And honestly, there's there's no ax to grind here. Uh, I'm flattered to, to, that you'd have me on the show. And, and I'm also a, a big fan of the cars. And uh, I think they're beautiful. Uh, and I think what Elon Musk has been has done has been great for our world. I think he was really a tipping point in, in forcing the big autos to to move more toward electronic vehicles. And let, let's face it, you know, one has to question why they had never really wanted to do it on their own, how they needed external government pressure to to increase uh, gasoline efficiency when that at the end of the day would just lower the cost of ownership for their product, which is a good thing, but yet they didn't do it. And one has to wonder why that is. So I think Elon you know, with respect to Tesla and electronic vehicles and our environment has done the world a huge service. Absolutely. And so I just want to lead that, that, that I'm a fan. I, I think the cars are beautiful. I wish I had one. Uh, my kids always rave about how much, how awesome they are when they ride in one of their friend's parents' Teslas. Uh, it's funny. Um, and, and, I, and so I think there's a lot of good that has come out, out of uh, what Elon Musk has done in this space, as well as other spaces. Uh, and, and they're beautiful, great cars. So you guys are kind of approaching it from a just uh, an overvalued perspective on the company right now. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's really kind of an old school throwback to the fiduciary and the investor as opposed to the speculator, you know, and the trader, right? And look, there's no doubt, you know, as Jim Cramer said, he, you know, even he's a fan of Tesla for the last 1800 points, right? I mean, look, the, the, the momentum, the trading aspect here has been phenomenal and it's been a huge wealth creator. Uh, and, and our perspective was very narrowly focused on the fiduciary and and this idea of risk um, and in a market that's been such a strong performer since the uh, the nadir in, in March, you know, I think some people, we got some feedback that people were kind of looking, uh, you know, how to manage that, whether or not we were at the top or, or not in this market. And, and we thought, you know, look, the first thing you do is identify where there's the most risk in your portfolio. And so we kind of went through, we cover around 3000 stocks, uh, as well as ETFs and mutual funds, and we looked for like, okay, where's the where's the where's the risk extreme, uh, and then you know, especially with Tesla, you got to take into account all these sort of the optionality of all these great things that that Tesla might do uh, to justify the future cash flows embedded in the stock price, and we went through the checklist and we thought, okay, we think there's a fair case to be made here for those with fiduciary responsibilities. Again, fiduciary responsibilities. To, to take into account or consider the risk in the stock relative to fundamentals. Sure. So, yeah, I, I know that that's a big part of your note later on. So we'll definitely get through uh, to some of the valuation stuff. Um, so I thought probably the best way to kind of just kind of structure this was to go point by point. I've had a lot of listeners that have read your note and have sort of asked me to give my, my thoughts on it. So I thought, you know, what better way to do that than to have the man himself here to discuss it with me. So... Um, I'm ready. <laughs> all right, sweet. So you've got a lot of a lot. I mean, this is probably a few thousand word article here. So let's just start right at the top. So you start off by saying, really comparing the the valuation of Tesla per car sold versus other automakers. I wanted to just sort of get your thoughts on this because I think this you know this perspective or this this particular metric in isolation to me isn't all that particularly meaningful. Uh, so I wanted to just sort of get your take on why you chose to start off with this note, and then I'll give sort of my thoughts as well. Yeah, we just sort of a level setter to get a sense of how rich the expectations are, and you know, just to give some perspective, our approach to valuation is is to is, I, and I say this to all my new analysts: Would you rather be a fortune teller or a critic of a fortune teller? And we see Mr. Market or the stock market as a fortune teller. 
uh, he or she is giving us a price every day. And, and what we do at New Constructs is reverse engineer what the future cash flows, the revenue, the margins, the capital efficiency of the business, all that. We reverse engineer what those need to be to justify the price. And, and so um, what we like to do is just kind of, again, be objective uh, perspective on where valuation is. And that's what we see in this chart. Like there's a big disconnect. Um, it's not to say that Tesla can't achieve these expectations, but for right now, there's a lot of credit given to what the company will do in the future. Sure. And I think, you know, even the most stringent of Tesla bulls wouldn't argue that, you know, it's obviously not based on the profit flow today or the cash flow today. It's based on the growth opportunity for the future. And that's why you see the premium valuation and things like that. Um, one thing that I did want to add to this, so it looks like on this chart you have, you know, Fiat Chrysler, Ford, GM, Honda, Toyota. Um, there are other automakers that are actually priced higher per car than Tesla is here. Uh, so Ferrari, for example, their market cap is around $49 billion and they sold, you know, 10,000 cars last year. So if you compare that to Tesla on this chart, you know, Tesla's 88,000 per car in terms of market cap over the trailing 12 months. Ferrari's up there at 4.8 million. So that's, you know, five and a half times where Tesla is on here. And yet, you know, this is some of the founding principle for what you call Tesla to be, you know, the most dangerous stock in the market right now. So uh, if you're yeah. if you're going by this metric, wouldn't Ferrari be, you know, way more dangerous? That's that's five and a half times Tesla, 243 times to Toyota. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, we were looking for, for comps in terms of what the future uh, for Tesla is. Is, is promising to be right, um, and I, and I and I think ironically, like Ferrari, it maybe is a great comp um, if they're only going to produce how many cars do you say ten thousand? Right, um, you know that's a very different business model, uh, and and that's the maximum kind of audience that we're talking about with Ferrari for a car of that kind of level of quality. And you know, I was just having lunch with one of our investors, and and. You know, he made the comparison of, of a Tesla, it's sort of like a Ferrari, and that it's a handmade, really, really nice car. Uh, and there's no question about that, right? Uh, the problem is there's just not that many people in the world that can afford them. So, uh, and Ferrari serves a very particular niche, and they can sell at a super high average selling price. But that's not at all what I believe Mr. Musk and Tesla have said they plan to do. Sure. Uh, even at a $56,000 average selling price, you know, you're out of reach of a lot of people. Yep. Um, and, you know, you're, and so we really put them, you know, we wanted to make comps to other firms that are, are producing somewhere in the range of the number of vehicles that Tesla has said they plan to produce in order to sort of, you know, for the electronic vehicle market to take over. So in that sense, in some ways, Ferrari is a good comp, but I don't know if you really want them to be the comp because we're talking about, uh, you know, a, tar a total addressable market of maybe 10 or 15,000. I don't know if you look at Ferrari and Lamborghini, you get the idea. It's a very yeah. small addressable market. And, yeah. and I believe they're definitely, they're definitely different companies. I would totally agree with that. You know, Tesla doesn't aspire to be anything like Ferrari. They do aspire to serve a market more the size of Toyota, Volkswagen companies like that. The reason that I bring it up is because it shows how different this metric can, can be for, you know, different automakers. You know, you have Toyota at 20,000, then you have 20,000 market cap per car, and then you have Ferrari at 4.8 million. So I think it just highlights, you know, there's a lot of other factors that go into what the market cap should be other than just the number of vehicles sold, which I think you would agree with. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it's also important to have the right kind of comps. So if it's, if Tesla, if you're, if you're saying the Tesla is only competing against Ferrari, well, then that would be, you know, that's, then those are the right comparable companies. If they're competing against these guys and these guys are the right comps. Um, but you're right, you know, this metric on its own is not the end all be all. Sure. And I think that comes into, you know, profitability, which we'll get into later. That's really the big differentiator between a company like Ferrari and a company like Toyota. Ferrari can capture that greater profitability because they're in that higher, higher end segment. So I think we'll come back to that when we get into a little bit more of the modeling that you guys have done. Um, okay. So the next point here, this is on regulatory credits. You know, this is talked about a lot, obviously. I think most people following Tesla closely understand that Tesla's recognized, you know, six to eight hundred billion or billion dollars of credits in the first half of the year. Uh, they expect a similar number in the second half of the year. So it's a pretty significant portion of the profitability, or it's all of the profitability that Tesla is actually showing right now. Um, so I'd love to hear your perspective just on, you know, your concerns on the regulatory credits. Yeah, it's more just about um, optics, right? You know, is Tesla profitable? 
it's profitable based on it's not recurring revenue because we think those credits are going away. Uh, if you look at the plans for these these comps that we have, um, they're going to be producing more than enough cars so that they won't need to buy the credits from Tesla. So uh, it's not to say it's not real money. It's real money. It's that it's that really when you're thinking about profits, you know, it, the profits today, if you're going to be doing any work on them, um, are supposed to be relied upon as a proxy for future profits. And if the profits today are based on non-recurring or unusual revenue that will not be sustainable, uh, then that just makes then you need to, it's just something to be conscious of, right? The company the company's not quite as profitable. The current business model is not quite as profitable as it seems to be because it's based on some temporary credits. Yeah, and I, I would definitely agree with that. You know, I don't think anyone should be projecting those regulatory credits to be, you know, continuing into perpetuity or sort of like a final state cash flow, discounted cash flow model. You you shouldn't be including stuff like that. And I think Tesla's point of view is is pretty similar on that. They've said, you know, consistently on the earnings calls, they view that as something that they're funneling in to grow their business, but they don't operate the business um, requiring those credits to get to the place that, where they want to be from an operating margin perspective or things like that. Um, and I think the only other point that I would really make on that is that, you know, as we talked about, no one's really valuing Tesla today on on their gap profit. You know, it's trading at, I think, a thousand times trailing 12 months earnings. So, you know, that that sort of valuation doesn't make sense if you're not forecasting into the future. And I think, you know, at least hopefully, and I think a lot of the analysts are are forecasting for Tesla to not, you know, have that going in perpetuity. So I do agree with you. It's definitely something that is, is worth knowing. Um, and we just sort of need to see how the profitability evolves with that and without those credits being involved. Agreed. All right. So this, <laughs> this is a favorite one for Tessable. So market share and sort of competition. You say market share will drop precipitously as incumbents enter the EV market. So this part was probably the part of the note that I took the most issue with. So how you guys lay it out, you discuss the plans for Volkswagen, General Motors, Toyota, Ford for their electric vehicle plans for 2025. So you say Volkswagen plans to produce 1.5 million EVs in 2025, GM a million, Toyota 500,000, Ford 300,000. So in total combined about 3.1 million electric vehicles. And then you guys are saying that most analysts, you know, the, the, the highest estimate that you could find from analysts was about 2 million for 2025? Correct. Okay. That may need to be updated. I know for sure Alex Potter of Piper Jaffrey has a target higher than 4 million. And what I found to be sort of missing in this and potentially misleading is that Tesla's own targets are not discussed. Um, so it looks like you use Clean Technica's estimate of 1.3 million for 2025. So at that level, you know, you're at a third of what these other automakers are making in combination, which you say was 3.1 million. Yeah. Um, so are you are you aware of what Tesla's targets are for 2025? No, I think we looked for that. I guess we didn't see it. We didn't look close enough. What, what is Tesla's target? Okay, so Elon Musk on the Q1 earnings call confirmed that they continue to plan to grow at 50% compound annually in terms of the automotive units per year. So if you base that on the 2019 number of 368,000, that gets you to 4 million in 2025, a little bit above. Um, and that was specifically part of the question and Elon confirmed that yes, that is their target and he would be pretty shocked if they weren't able to achieve that. So I think a, a more accurate representation for this portion would, you know, you're including other automakers own targets. I think it'd be fair to include Tesla's own target here, but it sounds like you guys may have just, you know, overlooked that or didn't catch that on the yeah. conference call. That's, that's something. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's definitely a, a good data point, an important data point to add. Okay. Awesome. Well, that's good. Um, so I, I guess getting into that a little bit more then, I do want to talk about the other automakers then. I think, you know, it's important to include Tesla's goals. And then when we look at the other automakers, I think it's important to look at their track record on electric vehicles too, because it's no, it's just like it's no guarantee that Tesla's going to hit 4 million in 2025. It's no guarantee that Volkswagen's going to hit a million and a half. And that's where we all have to kind of bring our own analysis to the table. But I think, you know, when it comes to these other automakers, they've consistently missed their targets. Even if we just go back to 2018, with Volkswagen, you know, Herbert Dees at that point in time was saying that, you know, in 2020, we're going to have a vehicle that does everything that a Tesla can do, an electric vehicle, and it's going to be half the price of Tesla. And here we sit now, you know, two thirds of the way through 2020 and Volkswagen is in the process of launching the ID3, which I'm sure Dees was referring to with that comment. 
but the problem is it's starting at 40,000 euros, which is, you know, the Model 3 in Germany starts at 43,000 euros, so not quite half cheaper. And in terms of the functionality, it's definitely, you know, the ranges are comparable, but um, pretty much beyond that, you know, there's no autopilot, there's no supercharger network, there's no, um, the charging, the ability to recharge is about half the rate of the Model 3. So these vehicles that they're bringing to market have, have just continued to miss their targets consistently. And, you know, Volkswagen is just one example of that. So I'd love to hear, you know, your guys' thoughts on how that unfolds and how that impacts, you know, the research that you're doing here. Yeah, I think it's a great point. I mean, the uh, the electronic vehicle production projections have consistently been far greater than the actual performance. Uh, and, and, you know, what you refer to with respect to Volkswagen is, is, is absolutely true. And I, and I think we've seen the same thing with Tesla, right? The, the goals for what they were going to produce uh, have been dramatically higher than what they produced. Um, and so it's kind of anybody's guess, right? Like, you know, how do you know who's telling what? Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, right? Like, um, I think, you know, in the next section, we get into some reasons as to why the incumbents might have a you know, good chance to meet some of those goals or maybe not, whatever. But I, yeah, I agree with you, man. There's no way to be sure, right? Because they're all saying, we're going to hit the moon with production. And so we know they're going to fall probably somewhere short of that. Um, uh, our point really more is to say, and really I think point out here that that the incumbents do plan to get into the market, and I think they can do so with a scale um, that they've proven they can achieve just because they've produced other kinds of cars with that kind of scale. I don't know that the electronic vehicle is so prohibitively um, difficult to create that they can't achieve comparable levels of scale, and Tesla's yet to achieve that scale. Uh, so there's just a difference there. Uh, not saying that they won't or can't, um, but they have that scale. Um, and and uh, when you're talking about you know average selling prices, I don't know that they all need to be you know as good as the top end Tesla. Um, and there's definitely room in the world for for and there's a market for the super high end cars. You know, like the Ferrari, it's just that that market's small. And when you look at the production increases implied by the stock price, uh, you know, they're, you know, Tesla, that's not going to get Tesla investors where they need to be to justify the current valuation. Okay. So let's maybe, I think I want to come back to competition a little bit, but I think maybe we want to go into the valuation because I think that, you know, a lot builds on that in terms of whether you're bullish or bearish. So. Yeah. Do you want to walk us through a little bit of the modeling that you guys have done on the company? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, look, it's 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 um, it's probably the simplest approach to valuation that there is out there in the sense that all the assumptions and projections and numbers are all very straightforward. There's no multiple that kind of assumes a certain future stream of cash flows and kind of condenses that into one little ratio. I think there's a lot of attractiveness to that level of simplicity, but it's also kind of a black box, right? Like we can, you know, a thousand times, nobody believes in a thousand times multiple, but they do believe there is some embedded future cash flow life cycle that's baked into the stock price. And, and I think it's more helpful to look at it through that lens. And so what we do in all of our valuation is we use what's called a reverse dynamic discounted cash flow model. And that just means that instead of looking at the valuation of a given company over one period of time, like say five, 10 years, and then assuming some uh, perpetual growth or terminal value that's based on a multiple that, that captures all the growth after that five or 10 year forecast horizon, we just use a model that, that actually looks at the value of the business according to multiple forecast horizons. And really we just keep adding to the forecast horizon for as long as we need until that model generates a value equal to the current stock price. So we're not trying to predict the stock price, right? We're not trying to be um, fortune tellers, we're critics of the fortune tellers. So we take Mr. Market's price and we say, okay, what kind of revenue and profits and CapEx do we need for the business to get there? And then we take a look at what those revenue, profits and CapEx are compared to what the company's done in the past. And we say, okay, all right, high risk is, stocks where the future cash flow expectations are drastically higher than what the company's done in the past. Low risk is where cash flow expectations are lower than what the company's done in the past. It's a very simplistic approach to the valuation aspect. 
Yeah, and that I think that's a great way to look at things. It's like, okay, what needs to happen to justify the share price today? You know, put simply, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think everyone should really always be asking themselves that question. You know, that's the fundamental of if you want to buy the stock or if you want to sell the stock is what, you know, what needs to happen for it to be justified. So I think that's a really good way of looking at things. Um, what you kind of said there at the end, though, kind of made me question because it sounds like that would just lead to any growth company from the way that you guys look at things, you know, that's going to be higher risk fundamentally because it's not based on past performance. It's based on a future projection. And it sounds like regardless of, you know, the likelihood of that future, your guys' model would tell you that that's too high risk. Is that an unfair characterization or? No, no, I think growth stocks are definitely inherently riskier than value stocks because there's more of the valuation is dependent on future cash flows. That's absolutely true. So how do you reconcile that then with how the market tends to perform over the long term? Because obviously growth stocks can provide a significant return on investment. You know, we've seen that from companies like Apple, Amazon, you know, the list goes on and on. Now we're seeing it from Tesla. So if you're using this as a filter, don't you just miss out on all those opportunities? You absolutely can, right? And look, there's a there's a litany of papers written by some of the top minds in the business that value investing is dead. And uh, I'm not here to say that it isn't. <laughs> and you're absolutely right, Rob. Like, I mean, uh, you know, we, you know, as it's obvious, like our track record's out there, we've been dead wrong about Tesla. We were saying it's expensive before, and yet here it's still going up, right? So, uh, and that's really why our focus this time around is, is, is to really be more outspoken about who our target audience is here. It's not the trader, it's more the fiduciary. I'm looking at the level of risk. Uh, and we've seen growth stocks, uh, in a particular, you know, just a handful of stocks as of late, really, really, really outperform. And, um, people have made a lot of money on that uh, we're just kind of here to say hey look fiduciaries past stock price performance is not necessarily the best strategy for determining where you allocate capital uh, as stocks go up they inherently become more risky the implied cash flows required to justify the valuation also get higher uh, and and so where does it end right i mean i don't think anyone would argue that tesla should be have an infinite value uh, so at some point you know, there there is a there's a fair value, and I think the accelerated uh, improvement in the stock, or rise in the stock, is is enough to give people some pause with respect to valuation. But does valuation matter? Uh, not to everybody. Uh, probably not to a majority of investors. If it does matter to you, then our work is helpful. If it doesn't matter to you, our work is not helpful. And valuation not mattering based on you know people just trading on sort of perception on where things are heading. Are you saying? And not really basing yeah. your investment on the fundamentals. Correct. Uh, yeah. When I say valuation, yeah, I mean I mean fundamentals, right? And, and again, I'm not here to say fundamentals should be 100% of the process for everybody. By no means, uh, but they shouldn't be zero percent of the process for fiduciaries um, or for many investors. Um, but yeah, valuation doesn't matter. Uh, and when I think about valuation, that is in rela in relation to some measure or any measure of fundamentals, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So let's go through a little bit more on the valuation then, because I do have some thoughts on that. So it sounds like from what you guys are modeling, you think a more fair price for Tesla right now based on, you know, as you say, what they have achieved in the past and sort of the market share available to them would be something more in like the 200s. Yeah. So right? we, did, we did a few different scenarios and that's kind of the benefit of the, of, of the modeling technology we have, right? Because a part of what New Constructs has done for valuation is bring technology to the process. That's part of why I can appreciate what Tesla's done, right? They're bringing better technology to the to the car business in many ways on a lot of different levels. We sort of did the same thing in that we have automated what traditionally was a very cumbersome and difficult and complex activity to build these kinds of models. And so we can run an infinite number of scenarios through the model. So one of the scenarios was where we assume Tesla can get to a 7% margin, which is equal to, a to, to Toyota and grow revenue by over 25% compounded annually for a decade. Um, and that's, if, if, if they can do that, then it's worth eight, 813 bucks a share. Um, that price would imply that their after-tax cash flow would be 17 billion at that point in time, um, which is just a little bit below where Toyota is at 19 billion. So basically 813 million, uh, uh, 
$813 a share means they're going to basically be as, as big as Toyota. Right. And then the market cap comes out to be, you know, somewhere around 150 billion, which is, you know, pretty close to where Toyota's at. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes sense. And I think, you know, you guys, as you said, you modeled a lot of different scenarios here. I think, you know, to justify today's price, you had at an average selling price of around 37,000, it would be required for about 14 million deliveries per year in uh, 2020 or 2030, sorry. Uh, at 37, an ASP of 37K, it's 14 million vehicles at 20, which is the average car price in the US. Uh, at 24,000 ASP, which is where Toyota is, that's 22 million vehicles by 2030. And then if it's 16K ASP, which is where General Motors is, you're looking at closer to 33 million vehicles productions to justify the current price. Okay. And also what Elon Musk said on the Q1 call is that they continue to try to target the 50% compound annual growth rate, not just to 2025, but also to 2030, which would mean about 20 million in 2029. If you throw another 50% on that, that's 30 million. That's probably, you know, they're not going to add 10 million in capacity in one single year. Uh, but they are targeting, you know, vehicle production around that level. And then, of course, they also have the solar and energy businesses, which they can grow alongside that. So I think those targets in and of themselves, you know, those are in line with what Tesla is targeting. But then you don't you're not discounting back any of the risk for the next decade. So you probably wouldn't want to make that investment solely based on the numbers that you present there. What I found, you know, to be my biggest argument with how that valuation model is laid out is the operating profit assumptions, because you say at 7%, that's equivalent to where Toyota is right now, right? And that's what you have in the model. 7%, 7 uh, after-tax profit margin, that's right. Yeah. So that was where I think Tesla has so much more opportunity. You know, if you think about Toyota's business model, they have dealerships. They're sharing some of that profit margin with their dealerships. Obviously, that's a huge business in and of itself. Tesla doesn't operate under the dealership model. So right there already, you're getting some of that operating margin that's going to be with Tesla rather than with the dealership model. I think that should be included as a premium to a company like Toyota that's not as vertically integrated. Furthermore, Tesla has that same vertical integration throughout the supply chain. They go farther down in the supply chain than a company like Toyota does. Toyota is doing a lot more assembling than a company like Tesla. So Tesla, again, has more opportunity to capture more of the operating margin throughout the supply chain. So there's a couple of reasons there. And then the third and probably the biggest reason for Tesla bulls is that Tesla has the ability to capture margin through software that Toyota does not have right now and is unlikely to you know, have to the degree that Tesla does over the next few years, at least. So what I mean by that is right now Tesla's selling an $8,000 software option. And you can, you, know, you can criticize that and say, oh, Tesla's not full self-driving, like the terminology is misleading, whatever the case may be, but customers are still buying this. It's contributing to the financials right now. And as Tesla continues to develop the feature set and they can recognize more of that revenue, which isn't all recognized today, which is actually hurting their profitability, going back to our previous discussion, once Tesla can start to recognize more of that revenue, they deliver more of those features, more customers start to opt for that feature, that becomes a huge profitability boost for the company that a company like Toyota is not in a position right now to capture. So I think using them as a comparison doesn't really get the full picture for sort of all those three reasons. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think those are great points, Rob. Uh, you know, I think on the software side, um, yeah, I mean, if uh, Toyota doesn't have, have an answer for that now, who's to say, you know, whether they'll ever create one? Who, uh, you know, who knows? Um, I would imagine they would try to. I feel like that's part of the sort of electronic vehicle equation is that it's a, it's a much more software and electronic driven. And we see cars are being more sort of computer driven. I mean, my dad's like an old muscle car guy, right? He's, he used to, you know, he, he bought a Firebird like 20 years ago and he spent all his time bragging to me about how um, he tweaked the computer to make it faster, you know, and whatever. But, you know, when, when he went from a car that had no computer at all. And so, I mean, that, that's, I think that's a general trend. And, and I think Tesla's definitely a leader on that front. Uh, and I would imagine that some of the incumbents will catch up a little bit. Maybe they won't be as good. Um, you know, maybe Tesla will be the Ferrari of the, of the com computer sort of the software on that on that side too. Um, when it comes to the to the dealerships and the other economies of scale, I think you're speaking to with respect to Tesla. You know, I, I wonder. You know, look, the dealerships are a distribution platform, uh, and so they're important to being able to move that many vehicles. Uh, and so, I don't know if there's a more profitable way to do it. Uh, I think it, that model's been in place for a while. 
and, and those distribution uh, mechanisms allow these car companies to focus on what they do best, uh, which is putting together a you know, really high quality vehicle and, um, and then distribute it out to the place that helps them monetize that capability as best possible. So in, in some ways, you know, I think a lack of dealerships could be a competitive disadvantage in terms of the distribution scale that the incumbents have, have demonstrated and have worked for a, a long time. Uh, I think they do it that way and have done it for decades because it, it works. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe that's something Tesla dis disrupts all, altogether. Um, but I think that there have been many attempts to sort of sell cars directly online and, and whether it's it's a sort of a true car or Carvana, um, those business models don't work that great. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, if you're moving 19 million vehicles a year or so, which is you know where a company like Toyota is, um, you know, it's that's um, – so that's a lot. It's a lot of stuff to do. So it helps to distribute that out to distributors to in turn focus on that. The vertical integration. I sort of feel like it's a similar argument, right? Like I think, you know, there, you know, the Michael Porter and, and all the business school folks love to talk about the benefits of vertical, um, you know, uh, upstream and downstream integration and their trade offs. Otherwise, everybody would do it. Uh, and the trade offs are that the more you integrate, the more complicated your business, and in some ways, the more expensive it is to run because you're having to have uh, more than just one competency. We found in the, in, in the world today, specialization tends to be a place where people get more advantage. And I think that's where we've seen a lot of the, the car makers evolve today. And, and we've seen you know, GM and Ford in particular over the years dis, disinvest uh, certain parts of the business. And you've got entire companies that used to be part of GM that make, just make the seats um, so that GM can again uh, focus on assembly and production. They're more of a core competency. So there's some benefits to not being vertically integrated and how that plays out uh, will be interesting. But I, I don't know if, if I would be willing, at least at this level, to bet that they will be a, a, you know, a panacea for, for increased profit margins, right, going forward. And, and you know, uh, even if they are, you know, my, my point really is with these kinds of numbers, so it's, that, that good news is priced in, right? If you say they're going to be at 30 million vehicles in 2030, which is about where the rest of the world will be, that's 50% market share. Um, but I think that the the total market for electric, electronic vehicles in 2030 is supposed to be around 26 million. So, you know, I don't know, right? Like these numbers, something's got to change here. And when we look at the valuation and it's already got all these good things priced into it, that's when I say as a fiduciary – you know, how much higher can it feasibly go? Sure, to the moon with the momentum and uh, momentum strategy. But from a fundamental perspective, I would say that a lot of the good news is probably priced in. Yeah, and I think that's where it comes back to, I think I want to kind of address most of those points. So specifically on the dealership model, you know, Tesla's already proving that that has worked for them to the scale and they already are capturing that share of the margin. You know, they have a store's infrastructure, so they're not relying entirely on online selling. Um, and you know, so far they've not had demand concerns. They've been able to sell all their vehicles without even doing any advertising, paid advertising. Um, and it looks like they should be able to continue to, to scale that. Is there something on the advertising that you want to say? Oh, I think the advertising, no, it's a great point, right? Like all this stuff is awesome advertising. Like they don't have to pay for marketing and advertising, right? I mean, that's, that's part of the brilliance. I think of Musk and all that, that I give you absolutely there. It's, it's, it's amazing advertising. This is great advertising. It is, yeah. <laughs> all the stuff, the battleground stocks, great advertising, you know, all, all those antics, all great advertising. Yeah. So then on the dealership model, I think, you know, the, the point isn't that Tesla, you know, is revolutionizing how cars are distributed. The point that I'm making, even though they are, I think, to some extent doing that with relying more on online selling. Um, my point is that Tesla is already, even if you assume that cars have to be sold through a dealership network, I think we both agree that there is value for those companies. If Toyota, if Toyota acquired all their dealers, you know, their market cap would increase because they would be capturing that cash flow from the dealership model. So I think that's the point with Tesla is they're in a position where they're going to sell direct to customers and capture that that market share or that, that profit flow, um, even if it's not an entirely new business model. Would you agree with that, that that could provide upside to the operating profit forecasts? It absolutely could. It absolutely could. Um, 
and I, yeah, I just I don't know that it will. I, I, and I think maybe they've done it the way they've done it for a long time because when it comes to that kind of distribution, that's a whole other business in and of itself. Yeah. And I think in many ways, individually incentivizing those in, those dealerships, you know, they're independently owned. Um, it's probably a good model to good model to to have to maximize sales. So anyway, I, you know, that's. But I give it to you. It could, it could mean additional margin upside versus a Toyota for sure. And I think that's sort of the essence of my disagreement with the note is I feel like it's very, it, it reads very critical. And I think it doesn't necessarily discuss the possibilities for this upside. And I think there's so many different things that I can mention, you know, like we haven't even talked about Tesla insurance. That's another area that Tesla, you know, that's a huge multi-billion dollar business that Tesla is integrating themselves in. Elon said on the second quarter call that they, they're trying to build a legitimate massive insurance company. So there's so many little things like this that Tesla is doing. And yeah, you can criticize it and say like, it's, you know, that's too diverse. They're trying to tackle too many things. But I think the point is that if Tesla is successful in doing that, there's so much upside to the profitability because these other automakers, to your point, are very specialized right now. So they're not capturing the entire value chain where Tesla is positioning themselves to do that. So if you add even just a few percentage points of operating profit in your forecast, you know, those numbers go down from needing to sell 15 million vehicles per year to justify the share price in 2030 to maybe only needing to sell, you know, six or 7 million. And when Tesla's targeting 20 million, then if they do that and they also are able to grow at the rate that they are intending to grow at, then you have a valuation that's significantly above where it is today, probably one of the most valuable companies in the world. So I think that's where investors need to decide just on the likelihood and that's where you know this all gets interesting and that's where all the different points of view can and should come in from my point of view though i just i just like to see both sides being discussed like yes there are risks here but there is also some upside and i feel like the upside wasn't necessarily acknowledged and maybe you know from a fiduciary perspective as you said maybe a lot of those people need to focus more on the risk that is in existence which I'm not going to argue that there's definitely a risk to the valuation. That's very clear. Um, but when I think it comes to making individual investment decisions for myself, at least, it's important to also acknowledge the upside. Yeah, I think that's a fair point, right? I mean, we could have we could have been uh, a, a little a little more balanced. Um, all these notes could, could I, you know, a lot of them could be that way. I I, I would say. Too. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, but it would be to be kind of completely candid, it'd be a little bit of speaking out of both sides of my mouth because I just I don't necessarily buy that he's going to be able to be the first you know vertically integrated auto manufacturer. And, and look, getting into the insurance business, it's a completely different business. There are big companies that specialize in that, and to think that he's going to be able to compete head to head with them, you know, uh, there's a lot of optionality, a lot of stuff he says, and I, you know, I think a lot of this depends on execution, and. Yeah. And I think when you're looking at evaluation that depends on someone executing uh, things that have uh, maybe never been done, and when you're talking about executing on multiple things that have never been done, and, and that's what's baked in, you know, that's when you got to kind of say like, okay, all right, you know, hey, I believe in this a lot, but does it, does it, does it, you know, how much upside? Um, you know, all these things got to hit, um, and that's where I think the fundamental perspective is, hey, you know, if I haven't seen something like this before. I better be darn sure I believe that these things are going to happen if I'm willing to continue to leave my chips on the table here, especially considering how many, you know, the huge amount of gains people have here. Uh, and, and where is the most risk? And, and look, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're sleepy, sort of independent, kind of fundamentally oriented research firms. So, you know, we're always sort of trying to like balance risk reward. So if we see a company like Tesla, where there's sort of, you know, in our opinion, extreme valuation, uh, in terms of the expectations for future cash flows compared to what's happened in the past, we're saying, well, no, you know what? We'd rather be in something like Hershey, you know, where the stock price is implying the profits will permanently decline by 20%, uh, or Southwest Airlines, 30% permanent decline, or Simon Property Group, you know, 10% permanent profit decline, right? So we're, we're, we're like, we're not just looking at Tesla in isolation. We're saying, look, there are some great opportunities with way better risk reward. Right? If you believe that Southwest Airlines is going to get back to two thir- 2015 profit levels, the stock's got 15 to 20% upside. Um, you see what I'm saying? Like Those yeah. are super low expectations. And in contrast to the really high expectations, we just say, hey, man, if I have to choose between those two, I'm going to go with low expectations for now and, and trust that over the long term that'll be fine. Um, and I've made a huge amounts of money here in Tesla. It's just that at some point in time, um, 
I want to weigh the risk reward. I'm going to go where I get better risk reward. And, and, and that's sort of where we're saying. Um, and, and that's maybe not the smartest thing to do. Certainly we'd miss out on some of these riskier, growthier names for sure. Uh, but, but that's kind of our little niche of the world. Right. And that's just the philosophical difference between, you know, the inval- value investor mindset and the growth investor mindset, which, you know, I think a lot has been discussed about that. We probably don't need to go into a whole lot of detail on that. But I think I think something you said brought to mind for me, you know, you talked about having to bet on Tesla to accomplish these things that maybe have never been accomplished before in the past. And I think that's where for Tesla investors, we would point to the fact that Tesla has already done that. You know, there's never been an automaker that's produced 500,000 electric vehicles per year. There's never been a company that's been able to deliver a car like the Model 3. I mean, the owner satisfaction ratings across the board, whether you look at Consumer Reports, Bloomberg did a survey with 5,000 Model 3 owners, 99% of them said they agreed or strongly agreed that they would buy the car again. So Tesla's already proven that they have the ability to create this disruptive technology and capture a lot of value from doing that. So I think when we look into the future, there are a lot of good reasons to assume that at least to some extent that can continue. And I think the insurance business is a great example of that because Tesla has things within their business that no insurance company can have. Tesla has the telemetric data from all their vehicles. They're all connected to the cloud. Tesla can capture all of that. And they have you know eight cameras around the car constantly watching everything. They have radars, they have ultrasonics. They have all that data constantly streaming back to them that data is worth something and Tesla intends to capture that by using that data to create a better insurance product. No other insurance company can compete with that. So to completely ignore that in evaluation to me doesn't make sense. And you're not going to see any of that show up in like the historical numbers from Tesla. But if we look at the track record of technological development that Tesla has, it seems clear that some, some value, some discounted value from that should be assigned. And I feel like that's really missing here. Yeah, um, yeah, we don't speak to that. I think we really kind of kept it narrowly focused on sort of the car production uh, and, and wanted to make the point there. Uh, but I do think that there's there's likely to be some option value to some of these th- these things that, that you that you mentioned. Um, it's just how much, right? I mean, you know, that's it's a philosophical um, qu- a question for sure. And, and I do think that, and I as I said in the beginning, you know, look, Tesla and Elon Musk have done some fantastic things to make the world a better place. Uh, doing that uh, at the current scale and doing that at a GM type of Toyota scale though are two entirely different things. Uh, and I think sometimes people underestimate the operational competencies required to operate and to manufacture cars with that level of quality and that kind of scale. Um, and and so that's really sort of where we say, hey, you know what? You know, if he does it, great. How much more upside is left in the stock? Hard to say considering what's already priced in. Uh, but um, you know, we're not saying it won't happen. We're just saying it's 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 pretty it's a fairly big bet. You know, I mean, again, innovation and and amazing products are much easier to do at a smaller scale. Scaling that out is a, is a difficult thing to do. That's the big reach here, and and Tesla's not the only one trying to do it as well, right? Um, and these other folks have big plants and footprints that you know they can steer toward that. So they've had a little bit of an advantage on that doesn't manifest today because they haven't retooled the factories to do that, but there's basically some latent manufacturing capacity that will come online at some point. They're making a concerted effort to make that happen. So um, that you have to weigh against, hey, Tesla's got something that's better than everybody else. Uh, and if they scale that, that'll be amazing. Um, what do they? What are they able to, 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 to charge for that? How low can they get the average selling price? What can they sell, right? The $8,000 additional software package that's a, that's a big number, you know. That's over half of the average selling price for some GM cars. That's not something a lot of people are going to be able to afford. So, but maybe with with huge amounts of scale, that number comes down to five hundred bucks. Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe it becomes free with the way they can do things. Uh, those would be amazing things. And and I think if they if the company does hit on all these cylinders, you could you could still see us some upside. Yeah. I think that's you know that's what it all comes down to. Is investors have to assess you know the likelihood of some of those things, you know, what competition is going to do. For me, when it comes to competition, I just haven't seen enough to, you know, make me concerned that they're going to somehow immediately flip over their manufacturing capacity to produce these electric vehicles in scale that can be competitive uh, with what Tesla is doing. 
you know, this is the same argument that we've heard from people that have been bearish on the stock since 2012. You know, competition is coming. Competition is coming. And yeah, here we sit in 2020. Tesla just continues to gain market share. You know, I think market share was one of the things you talked about in your note. I don't have the exact quote here, but I think you said that um, competition is already gaining market share. I just want to point out that Tesla is actually actually growing their market share, even as they continue to face more competition. In the U.S., they've had 80% market share on electric vehicles for the last two years. That's been steady. In Europe, they've gone from 16% share in 2018 up to 31% share in 2019. As we know, they're building out Gigafactory Berlin. That should allow for further increases in scale once they can um, locally manufacture and reduce the cost from doing that, make more affordable vehicles. And then same thing in China. They went from 6% share last year all the way up to 21% share so far year to date in the first six months. And that's due to Gigafactory Shanghai. So even though all this competition has been coming for, you know, better part of a decade now, Tesla just continues to grow market share and they have no signs of slowing down. They're building out factories on three continents right now. They're expanding production as fast as they possibly can. Um, they should be at a million and a half vehicles probably at 2022, you know, midpoint of 2022 maybe. So that's, you know, where VW is targeting to be in 2025. It's just like <laughs> Tesla bulls get so frustrated with that line of thought because it's just, it has not happened. And yeah. even in the projections, it's still not even being projected to happen. So it just seems like an argument that, you know, is at this point falling on deaf ears for, for Tesla bulls. Yeah, no, I hear you. Right. I mean, look, at some point you've got to, you know, show up or shut up, uh, and yep. the incumbent automakers, you know, have, um, have not really shown up in the, in the way that they've been promising. Um, uh, I, I think that they will, uh, and, and so, you know, at some, on some level, and if they don't, you know, then, 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 um, it invites competition from a lot of other folks. Cause I don't think anybody, you know, in, in, in with a business mindset is going to want to necessarily leave these kinds of, you know, any kind, anytime some firm can earn margins, you know, really high margins, it's going to invite competition. Uh, and, and so, you know, whether it comes from the incumbents, whether it comes from other startups that we're already seeing, to, starting to see emerge, they'll be there if the margins are that high. That's just the law of competition, right? No one's going to leave a business out there that's making, you know, 100% return on domestic capital without competition because they'd be happy to, to come in and make 99% return on capital all the way down to, you know, the law of competition says margins eventually go to zero in, in highly intensely rival, uh, high rivalry uh, industries and sectors. So, um, yeah, but you, to your point, yes, they got to put up or shut up. Um, and and you know the the market share stats in Europe I've seen are, are different. So I, I don't you know and I, but your yours are probably better than mine. I've I've, I've read that you they, may be including the like plug in hybrid. Mine's just pure battery electric vehicles, but oftentimes some of those stats are plug in hybrid, which to me, you know, throwing a twenty mile battery in your car doesn't really make it an electric vehicle to me. But a lot of those market share comparisons do include those plug in hybrids. Yeah. So, um, and, and look, those market share gains are deserved because Tesla does have a first mover advantage. The question is, you know, how long does that last? Is it perpetual? Uh, and we found in the past, th they tend not to be, you know, if you've got a great business idea, you know, you're earning high returns, you're earning great margins. Uh, you know, people are going to come in and want to get a piece of that. But if you're, if the barriers to entry are too high for anyone else to get in because your technological expertise is just too good, um, then you can maintain those high margins for a long period of time. You know, that's what we've seen with Apple. Um, and I, you know, I would submit that, you know, according to our models, Apple was as much a value stock as it was a growth stock in terms of its level of profitability, its valuation for a while. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that, those are, those are things, those are, those are all fair arguments. Those are all fair arguments. Uh, the, you know, the incumbents may never get there. I think they will, and if they don't, someone else will, just because, again, people will come after high margins. And I'm not sure that the technological advantages uh, are, are that great. Because we have seen a few decent, you know, I don't know, like the Nissan Leaf, right? I mean, is that, is that such a terrible car? Does that prove that they can't do it? I, I don't know. You probably have a better sense of the comparison there. But I see that as like, hey, there's a low-end car that uh, they've proven they can't produce, um, the uh, Chevy Volt, right? I mean... What did these mean to the competitive landscape? Uh, maybe nothing. Um, what, what, would you, what would you say to those? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point to bring up. I think that's one of the points I actually wanted to make too is, you know, the Chevy Bolt, if we look at that, that came out before the Model 3 did. They actually beat the Model 3 to market. It came out at the same price point, had the same amount of range. It actually won the Motor Trend Car of the Year in 2017. 
you know, this would be seen if you went back in time into 2013 and you said, hey, GM is going to accomplish all those things in 2017. You'd be like, oh, like, okay, I'm not going to invest in Tesla. Well, that all happened. And Tesla has sold, you know, 300,000 Model 3s in 2019. GM sold, I don't know, maybe 20, 25,000 volts, 30,000 at best. So like there's some reason that customers are responding so significantly to Tesla's vehicles, even though the Bolt is, you know, from a spec perspective comparable. And it's all those other factors that Tesla has huge advantages on that are causing that. And those advantages only seem to be growing. So, you know, a big one is, is the supercharger network. No one else has been willing to make the investment that, you know, Tesla has for a better part of 15 years now um, to build out a supercharger network that, you know, can provide you know, worldwide charging for their customers. No one has that. They're waiting for third parties to step up and do that because that's their business model. They wait for the suppliers to, you know, specialize and take their part of the business. Tesla is, you know, Tesla's not willing to sit around and wait for that to develop. So they needed to do it themselves. And that has just provided them with, you know, more of a competitive moat that is now leading to these massive market shares, even as competition comes on board. And I think Autopilot is another great example of, of that. We probably haven't talked enough about Tesla's autonomous, you know, capabilities in this conversation because any any bull thesis, that's sort of the underlying, you know, optionality, as you said earlier. If Tesla accomplishes robotaxis, you know, throw a 7% operating margin way out the window because you just rake in software margins day after day after day after day with no labor costs. Personally, I don't really model for that because I like to make sure that the valuation is justified without having to get to an autonomous robo taxi situation because it is still so unclear on whether that can happen. But what I love about Tesla and their technology is that even today, that's already benefiting their bottom line through the selling of autopilot and you know those driver assist technologies. And that comes standard. Like Tesla has the $8,000 full self-driving option, but they also have driver assist technology with the autopilot suite that now comes standard. So you can you know stay in your lane, traffic aware, cruise control, things like that. That's all standard with the $38,000, you know, standard range plus Model 3. You can't get that level of technology on a Bolt. So it's like the charging network, the technology suite, the performance. The Bolt may look comparable when you first look at the stats, but there are so many other factors that consumers are considering in the value proposition that goes into Tesla that other companies just are not able to compete with. And even in their announced product lines, which go out two to three years, they're still not, you know, even putting on concepts that are going to be able to compete with what Tesla is offering today. So that's where I say, like, if we look at the past performance and we look at what Tesla's plans are, it's just very clear that that deviation between the companies is going to continue. And that's going to put financial stress on these other companies that, you know, they're going to have to, as you said, switch over their plants. They're going to have to go through that period of ramping up electric vehicles where they're not profitable because they're not at scale yet. And Tesla's already there and Tesla is ruthless. They're just going to keep going down market and make it even more difficult to compete with them once they have localized manufacturing on three continents, how, how does another automaker that's not at scale compete with something like that? I just, I, I cannot see that happening. I think they're, they're, they are converting a lot of these plants. I think that's why they're saying they're going to bring on this level of uh, production in 2025. That's what the plans, that's what the $225 billion that the incumbents are expected to spend is going to do uh, because they recognize that this is uh, an unstoppable trend and they need to, they need to um, step up or shut up. Uh, I think they're going to try. Uh, I think that is their plan, and um, and I think the bolt bolt may, maybe been more just sort of a concept or proof of concept and something that they can then float out there. Works okay. Let's regroup and now we're going to do this with real scale. They have that scale in place. They have the factories around the world to to produce that. Um, I so, would argue that point though, because I don't, I don't really think it's that comparable. Like, there's a lot of conversion that needs to happen. BMW just shut down for two months to make, you know, convert their one of their main plants. So, not only are they having to put in the capital investment to, um, you know, convert their plants over, they also have to take the downtime on their current production, which you know, two months for BMW from their most highly product, like most productive factory, that's costing them like a billion dollars in, um, in gross profit. So they have to they have to divest their legacy investments and then they also have to make these new investments and then they also have to get to scale and then they also have to be able to compete with the you know value proposition that Tesla's offering, the supercharger network, autopilot. They just have so many things that they have to do. And Tesla's already ahead and isn't slowing down. 
So that's where I say like, yes, I think they do need to convert and they are going to try to convert, but I don't see how they can get to the place that Tesla is at right now, simply because they have these shells of buildings that they can put, you know, some electric, you know, electric vehicle manufacturing processes in. It's, it's just a very different ball game with electric vehicles than internal combustion engine. Yeah, I know. I hear what you're saying. Um, uh, and I think, you know, part of the reason it's taking a while is that it takes a while to do some of this conversion. And I think part of the reason they're spending so many billions of dollars to do it is that that's what they got to do, um, you know, to, to make sure they don't have to shut down. You know, look, these, these incumbent automakers are still making a lot of money right now. So it doesn't make sense for them to shut down. Uh, makes sense for them to get into it slowly, deliberately, carefully, so that when they do enter, they can enter with scale. Um, whether they can do that or not, um, I don't know. Rob, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm running late into another meeting. Sure. I'd love to continue the conversation, man. I'm not trying to bail out on you, but it's yeah. being the big potential. No, you have spent quite a bit of time with us already, so I definitely appreciate that. We can continue if you want some other time. I'm really not, I really don't want you to think I'm bailing, but I'm, I'm six minutes late now to another meeting with a big prospect. Yeah, no worries. I appreciate you staying over. Um, I thought this was a good conversation. I think, you know, hopefully helpful for both of us. I uh, appreciate you taking the time. I know it's it's not always fun to get into a you know competitive debate like this, but um, I do think it's helpful, so I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, great to meet you, and again, I'm happy to continue at some point. All right, sounds good. Thanks, David. Thank you, Rob. This was fun. All right, bye.